In this video, I'm going to show you how to design real-time PCR primers by using NCBI's Primer Blast. So the first step you have to do when you're designing primers is um, head on over to the NCBI website. And within the search bar at the top, you want to search for the gene you're interested in. In this example, I'm going to design real-time PCR primers for the gene interleukin-6 in humans. I'm just going to search interleukin-6. And then on the drop-down menu, you want to select nucleotide. So this is the part of the website we want to search. And you hit the search button. This will return all of the information on this part of the website related to the gene in Tolucan 6. And as you can see, there are different species. Uh, and we're interested in humans. So a quick way you can filter out and find this is on the right, you could see you can search by organisms. So you can click Homo sapiens. And by doing that, I can then see the top result says Homo sapiens in Tolucan 6, transcript variant 1, mRNA. So what you're looking for is the mRNA. If you see results that have CDS in the name, this stands for the coding sequence. However, this will not contain inf any information regarding any introns. Ideally, when you're designing real-time PCR primers, you do want to contain the introns in the data. So always select the, the full transcript sequence. So you want to select the mRNA. So click on this. And this will take you to the page of this variant. Basically, what you're looking for is if you go on the right hand side, you'll see a little box here. Uh, and you're looking for this option here, this pick primers. So this is the NCBI Primer Blast um, software. So click on this and you'll be taken to the Primer Blast uh, window. Now you'll be presented with quite a lot of um, options that you can change here. So I'm just going to give you some optimal settings to start off with. Uh, and you can alter these if you so wish. So let's start off with the top box, PCR template. You'll notice that the accession number, so this is essentially a unique number associated with your gene, has already been entered. So you want to leave this uh, as it is. The range is if you want to specify you want to make a forward primer start at a certain position, uh, or a reverse primer start at a certain position, you would enter the base pair uh, location here. You can also upload your own FASTA file if you so wish, but because we want to design primers on this gene, we're going to leave it associated with the accession number. Next is the primer primers. At the top, you can use your own forward and reverse primer. So if you inputted your own sequence of primer here, um, it will find this for you on the results. But because we're designing new primers, we want to leave these blank. The next part uh, is the PCR product size. So what is the product size you want these PCR primers to make? So the maximum is already set at 1,000 base pairs. This is slightly big, especially for real-time PCR. So I would advise changing this to 200 base pairs. The number of primers to return is essentially the number of results you want the program to create. So I'd leave this at 10. And finally, the primer melting temperature. So the, the melting temperature is the temperature at which half of the DNA is single stranded. Now what I usually do is increase these slightly and I'll explain reasons why afterwards. So I change the minimum to 59 degrees the optimum to 62 degrees, and the maximum to 65 degrees. As a very loose guide, the, the melting temperatures of your primers should be three to five degrees higher than the annealing temperature you want to use in your PCR reaction. So for example, I'm selecting around a 62 degrees optimal temperature that I wanted to pick. This, the reason why I've done this is because I want to aim for around a 60 degrees annealing temperature for my PCR reaction. But obviously, you will actually know until you actually receive the primers what the optimal annealing temperature for that reaction is. On the end, it says max 
uh, melting temperature difference. So this is the difference between the forward and reverse primer. You want them to have a very identical melting temperature as close as possible. So we're going to leave this set at three degrees. The next window uh, is titled Exxon Intron Selection. So this is whether you want your primers to bind over an exon-exon junction or on two different exons that are separated by an intron. So you can select to span an exon-exon junction. And what this means is one of your primers will bind partly on one exon and then partly on the neighboring exon. Because remember, mRNA only contains the exons, it does not contain introns. So what this is doing is selecting for mRNA. It's to avoid any genomic DNA amplification. If you do select this, you can then specify the base pair number on the five side and the three side that you want it to bind. So this is saying seven base pairs on the five side and four base pairs on the three side. I personally don't select X on X on junction spans, but you can do if you so wish. What I do do, however, is to specify an intron inclusion. So I tick this option. And what this is doing is saying, I want one of my primers to bind on one exon and another primer to bind on a different exon. So therefore it is separated by at least one intron. And by doing this, it will limit the chance of genomic DNA amplification because introns are usually very, very big. Now underneath it's saying, what do you want the intron length in the range in base pairs to be? I'm going to put this down a little bit to 200 base pairs as the minimum, and then the maximum can be as big as you like. Because essentially, once I've done my PCR and run some products on a gel, if I see my PCR products that I'm interested in, if I see a larger PCR product than I was expecting, chances are that includes the intron, which would therefore mean genomic DNA has been amplified. Also, if the intron is so big, usually in the PCR reaction, the actual amplification will not actually occur because the product is so large. So these are just two ways you can limit genomic DNA amplification in your PCR reaction. For the final window, you don't really need to focus on this. So this is more getting into the specifics of the primer pairs itself. What I do recommend is that you check that the organism option has the, the unique ID for your organism of interest. So 9606 is the number for homo sapiens, humans. For those of you that uh, want a bit more flexibility in your, your primer design, you, there is also an option at the bottom that says advanced perimeters and you'll get a, a lot of detailed perimeters that you can change here, but I would advise leaving these as default to start off with. So to run Primer Blast, click on the button that says Get Primers. So the Primer Blast software will, will run and now it's calculating and determining the best primer pairs that you specified. This can take a few minutes or it could take up to an hour. Otherwise, you may get an error message here and that's because some of the settings that you specified in the Primer Blast window previously might not match the requirements for your gene. So you might have to go back and then change a few of the perimeters and then resubmit the form. So now you've been presented with the, the results. At the top, you'll have the graphical view of the Primer pairs. So what you have at the top in the gray bars, you have the exons for your gene. In this case, this is the interleukin-6 gene in humans. Uh, and as you can see, there is uh, five exons here, one, two, three, four, five. And then underneath, you've got your primer pairs. So you've got the arrows signify the primer pairs. So you've got the forward primer and then the reverse primer. And then if you scroll down, you'll get a detailed report for each primer set. So let's just look at primer pair one, for example. The Primer Blast software is giving you the sequence for each forward and reverse primer. Also the product length, so if you did a PCR this would be the product size in, in base pairs. The intron size, this is the good thing about using Primer Blast, we specified to do an intron inclusion. So that means Primer Pair 1, if I scroll up, you can see the forward primer is actually binding to exon 2 here. And the reverse primer is, is binding to exon 3. And obviously, in the middle, there'll be an, an intron here. So, 
it's specifying that the intron size is 1058 base pairs. So in between those exons, there is an intron that is 1058 base pairs long. So if I did a PCR and I had genomic DNA contamination in that, the product size that will be produced will be 1058 base pairs plus 91 base pairs. So that's how I'd know if I have any genomic DNA contamination in my PCR. The next column will tell you what strand the prime is bind to, the length, um, where on the gene it binds to, so the start and stop in base pairs, the melting temperature, the GC content, and then the two at the end, um, these are self-complementary scores that the primoblast algorithm calculates for the likelihood that the primers will bind to themselves and to each other. You want these scores to be as low as possible. Underneath, it's telling you that the products are, are actually binding to the right thing, so the Homo sapiens interleukin-6 transcript variant 1 mRNA. And you know that because it gives you the primer sequence here, and then it, it, it tells you that the complementary binding is occurring with these dots here. What it will also do, the advantage of using primer blast, is that it will blast your primer sequences to work out if they could potentially bind anywhere else in that genome. Now it's picked out two results here. So it's saying that those primers could potentially bind to Homo sapiens interleukin-6 transcript variant 2 and also variant 1. And it's given you the product length, which is exactly the same product length as what we uh, have for our variant. Now, this isn't an issue in this scenario because I'm not interested in different transcript variants. But if you was interested in amplifying a certain variant over another variant, you have to be careful here because obviously it could amplify different variants. So how do you know which primer pair to pick? Well, there's quite a lot of parameters you should take into account when you're looking for a good primer pair. I'll go over these in another video.